A reading from the book of the prophet Joel. Thus says the Lord, let the nations bestir themselves and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit in judgment upon all the neighboring nations. Apply the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come and tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for great is their malice. Crowd upon crowd in the valley of decision, for near is the day of the Lord in the valley of decision. Sun and moon are darkened, and the stars withhold their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem raises his voice. The heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a, is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the children of Israel. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, am your God, dwelling on Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall pass through her no more. And then on that day, the mountains shall drip new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the channels of Judah shall flow with water. A fountain shall issue from the house of the Lord to, the, to water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a waste, and Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, because they shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall abide forever, and Jerusalem for all generations. I will avenge their blood, and not leave it unpunished. The Lord dwells in Zion. Verbum Domini. Rejoice in the Lord, you just. The Lord is King, let the earth rejoice. Let the many isles be glad. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Justice and judgment are the foundation of his throne. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his justice, and all peoples see his glory. Rejoice in the Lord, you just. Light dawns for the just, and gladness for the upright of heart. Be glad in the Lord, you just, and give thanks to his holy name. Rejoice in the Lord, you just. Dominus Fabiscum, et cum spiritu tuo, Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam, Gloria Tibi et Domine. While Jesus was speaking, a woman from the crowd called out and said to him, Blessed is the womb that carried you, and the breasts at which you nursed. He replied, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Verbum Domini.
The whole month of October is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. And in case you haven't noticed already from the very beginning of October, October is full of some great saints already this week. St. Therese of Lisieux, who was the first saint in October, and then the guardian angels following the next day, those messengers of God who are always with us, assisting us. And of course, the greatest saint, St. Francis of Assisi, bow my head, were literally, as Franciscans were in the octave of St. Francis, we could say. This, this celebration is not just one day, but it, it goes on really throughout the whole year for us. St. Faustina, who was the messenger of divine mercy, the one who God gave the message of his great merciful love for this generation. And then yesterday, Blessed Marie, or not yesterday, but two days ago, Blessed Marie Rose de Cher, who was an American, also who was beatified, who was awaiting canonization, and Our Lady of the Rosary, of course. And yesterday, St. John Leonardi, who not many people hear about and know about St. John Leonardi, Two years after his priesthood ordination, he founded a religious community called the Clerks Regular of the Mother of God. And he founded this community in the midst of the Counter-Reformation, in the midst of the Protestant Revolution, to strengthen the faith and combat the heresy of Protestantism. St. John Leonardi, during his life, spread devotion to Mary and to Eucharistic adoration, especially the 40 hours devotion. Maybe some of you don't know about the 40 hours devotion that usually runs through Sunday through usually Tuesday. But in many dioceses up north, especially where I come from, every single parish has a 40 hours devotion. So almost every day of every week, there's a 40 hour celebration in the diocese where I come from in Harrisburg. And I would literally, literally say that's, that's what keeps devotion to the Eucharist cemented in people's faith. 12 Eucharistic adoration chapels in my home diocese. And he also encouraged frequent reception of Holy Communion at Mass, which wasn't so common at the time as it is today. The whole month of October is full of men and women who are devoted to the Blessed Ever Virgin Mary and also to the real presence of her Divine Son, the God-Man Jesus Christ, in the Holy Eucharist. And this can be said with surety, that wherever true devotion is cultivated to Mary, wherever there is true devotion to Mary, there is a strong sense of the faithful, of the real presence of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. The two go hand in hand. And why is this? Because Mary, by an act of faith and by an overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, gave God the Son a human nature. She gave God flesh. And in Greek, we call her Theotokos, which means God-bearer, the one who bore God. Now, let's be clear, Mary did not give birth to the divine nature. As God the Son, he existed, he exists from all eternity as God the Son in his divine nature. She did consent 
to giving God the Son a human nature, and in so doing we can say that she gave birth to God. She gave birth to Jesus Christ, the God-man. Again, the eternal Word who exists from all eternity with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit became incarnate and assumed a human nature in the womb of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary. That's a lot to swallow this early in the morning, using your theological muscles, trying to exercise you. But these things we should always be pondering. We take such advantage of these things as Christians, but these things have been revealed to us by Almighty God and been confirmed to us in the church throughout the centuries. The flesh of God the Son, Jesus Christ, was her flesh. He was not born of human seed, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. When a child is born, sometimes we say, right, he looks like his mommy, or she looks like the characteristics of his daddy. Sometimes children re resemble 50-50, and we say they he or she looks like both of them. In this case of Jesus Christ, there is no question about who, she, who Jesus Christ would look like. He was born totally of her, not of human seed. He would have had her characteristics, her look, her genes. Jesus Christ would have looked entirely look like his virgin mother, Mary, 100%. And wouldn't it seem logical that we would want to draw close to that woman who channeled him into the world? Wouldn't it seem logical that we would want to draw close to the one who gave God the Son flesh? Wouldn't it seem logical that we would want to draw close to the woman who knew him the best? And wouldn't it seem logical that we would want to draw close to the woman who loved him the most? Apparently not, to some. The Gospel text from St. Luke today is well known in Protestant circles as the anti-Marian proof text. The anti-Marian proof text. In other words, this text is used to try and convince faithful Catholics that Jesus himself is directing emphasis away from his mother, away from a filial affection to his virgin mother. Again, it says, while Jesus was speaking, a woman from the crowd calling out and said to him, blessed is the womb that carried you and the breast at which you nursed. He replied rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Some try and twist this text. You could say, and they say, look, Jesus is correcting the woman for praising his mother, for praising him and nursing him at her breast. Some say, in fact, that Jesus is downplaying the relationship of his mother and that this relationship is not significant. This has never been the teaching of the church. This has never been the teaching of the early fathers, the early councils, all throughout the history of the church, the lives of the saints, the theologians of the church. 
This has never been the mindset of the church that this text downplays Christ's filial affection for his mother. We can, of course, agree on one thing, that more blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. And this is common sense. What perhaps those who use this gospel as an anti-Marian text fail to realize is this point, that the Blessed Virgin Mary conceived Jesus in her womb precisely because she heard the word of God and observed it. They don't get that point. That Jesus is, in a sense, magnifying, putting a magnifying glass on the fact that his mother did the word of God, did the will of God, cooperated with the divine plan. She heard the word of God and carried it out in her life through grace. The truth is Jesus was not the least bit downplaying his earthly relationship with his mother. He would not have been breaking the fourth commandment of the Decalogue. Remember, Jesus Christ fulfilled the commandments better than any of us ever fulfill the commandments. He's God. And he would have fulfilled the fourth commandment to its perfection, honoring his father and mother, his foster father, St. Joseph, and his virgin mother, Mary. He was, in fact, exalting his mother again and saying, my mother has heard the word of God. And acted upon it and in cooperating with grace she observed it the Blessed Virgin Mary humbly submitted herself to the miraculous plan of God and observed it remember I am the handmaid of the Lord she says I am the handmaid of the Lord be it done unto me according to thy word. The handmaid. Mary heard the word of the angel, and she believed the word of the angel, and in believing, she conceived. As St. Augustine says, Mary conceived first by an act of faith in the divine plan, and in so doing, she conceived in her womb. She believed first by an act of God, by cooperation in her mind. And in so doing, she conceived in her womb. She heard the word of God. And by the overpowering of the Holy Spirit, she gave birth to the eternal Son of God in her womb. The incarnation of God the Son, Jesus Christ, in the womb of his mother, Mary, is considered one of the greatest works of God. This is where, and this is a whole nother discussion, a whole nother homily, this is where faith and works come together. In the person of Mary, Mary's greatest act of faith was by her cooperation, by her cooperation with grace. And it was the work of God, the work of God acting in her and through her that brought about the greatest work that God designed. The incarnation. 
This is where we see faith and work acting together. Faith working through charity. Faith working through obedience. Faith working through hope. Mary cooperated in the work of God. And God took the initiative and Mary responded. God moves. He makes the first initiative, the invitation. He invites us, not just with Mary, but Mary to an exalted fashion. But each one of us, he invites us to make the response. This is why we can say that Mary's faith is the greatest act of faith that a human person has ever made. This is why Mary's act of faith was so pure, so immaculate, obedient. She's the model of how a human person responds to Almighty God. She doesn't put up any obstacles. She doesn't put up any roadblocks. She's not selfish. She's not self-centered. She's not egotistical. She never thought about herself. And that's how each one of us, hopefully, are striving to be in our faith It's a daily struggle, isn't it? To just battle those obstacles. To battle those roadblocks that we put up in the way of our relationship with Almighty God. Mary teaches us how to overcome that. By her loving, ardent faith, by her steadfast hope, and by her burning charity, She teaches us how to overcome those obstacles and selfishness in our life. What this scripture verse is really saying is that Mary's act of faith is the model, the archetype for any act of faith. And we should analyze our faith up against Mary's faith. The Blessed Virgin Mary helps us and assists us in cooperating with the divine divine plan as she did. Again, we want to know the person, we want to be close to the person who knew Jesus best. And we want to be close to the person who loved him the most. She's our mother. From the cross, he gave her to each one of us. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. That she gave, he gave his own ever virgin mother to each one of us to be our mother in the order of grace, to help us along the way to salvation. Father Angelus would often say that Mary gave flesh and blood and bone to our God. She made him lovable, huggable, kissable, tangible, edible, Eatable God in our midst. She gave him eyes to look out upon the multitudes, to see those who were suffering, to see those who were crying out for mercy. She gave him hands. to reach out to those who were lepers, those who were downcast, to those who were caught in sin like the adulterous woman 
to reach up, that the Lord would send, reach down and pick her up. She gave him a back that would be scourged and beaten for our salvation. She gave him a shoulder that carried the cross to Calvary. And she gave him a heart that literally beat underneath her heart for nine months in her womb. And this heart still continues to beat for each one of us. His sacred, most adorable heart. We owe so much to the ever-blessed Virgin Mary.